Um, so my talk today is about my experience as a mayor of a coastal community that's dealing with um, a variety of impacts around climate change, sea level rise, and extreme weather. So Gloucester was impacted um, both from an economic standpoint and um, a coast as a coastal city. So I'm going to take you through some of the threats that that the city faces, as do other coastal communities, and some of the ways that we have risen to the challenge of those threats, and maybe some lessons that can be learned for other coastal communities. And also, um, just to think about and engage around policy issues going forward as we confront some of these challenges. So this is a report from the front line. The front line, and this is Hurricane Irene that is coming up the coast. And Massachusetts is right up here. And I don't know if you remember Hurricane Irene, but it was a pretty significant hurricane that actually cut inland and it created the tornadoes in the Springfield Western Mass area. So in that case of that extreme weather event, the coast had some impacts, but that one actually went inland and had more severe impacts. But that is, that is our front line. And as we just saw, Joaquin, is it Joaquin or Joaquin? The hurricane that just, Joaquin. Um, and you look at what uh, Carolina, the Carolinas are dealing with, any of us on the coastline could have been in the brunt of that storm. So let me just tell you a little bit about Gloucester. By the way, this is, this is a presentation that's in Sway. Has anyone heard of Sway? It's kind of like the new and groovy PowerPoint. And so this is my first time using it, so I am experimenting on you guys, but hopefully the, the format is okay. Um, so Gloucester is 38 miles north of Boston. This map is a little bit misleading. We're actually an island, and we're separated from the mainland by a highway, a drawbridge, and a train bridge. So this is all a river in between the island part of Gloucester and then the western part of Gloucester. So we have 62 miles of coastline. This is Eastern Point. This is the Inner Harbor. This is all Ipswich Bay up here. This is the Atlantic and Massachusetts Bay. Um, the population is about 30,000, swells to about 60,000 in the summertime. In 1606, Samuel de Champlain sailed into Gloucester Harbor under the power of the wind and called it Le Beauport. So Le Beauport was sort of the first name of Gloucester and the uh, community was settled in 1623. And the um, settlers actually went to Salem because the ground was a little bit more fertile. Gloucester is on a basically a hunk of granite, but people came back because of the protected port and the commercial fishing industry in the state of Massachusetts was born in Gloucester, America's oldest seaport. Commercial fishing has been going on for over 400 years. In fact, a codfish hangs in the chamber of the, the house, uh, the house chamber in, um, in the state house. If you look, so if you've ever been in the state house in the, in the round area where the house um, representatives meet, behind the wall in the back, there is a, a Gloucester cod. And then this is the iconic statue where, that commemorates the fishermen who have gone down to sea. So over 10,000 fishermen over the course of Gloucester's history has gone down to sea in ships and never to return. And it, in, if, if, did anyone ever see The Perfect Storm, the movie, George Clooney? So the opening scene is of the cenotaph that is in our city hall, and there are 
10,000 names listed in the cenotaph. It just goes from floor to ceiling all around um, a staircase. And you can see the years where huge storms came through and took out two or 300 people at a time. And then as the technology changed, um, the numbers are smaller, but every year or so we lose fishermen. So on the boulevard, um, there is a, an iconic statue commemorating, and that is their resting place because obviously there is no um, burial for those who perish at sea. So just to kind of give you some of the pop culture, Wicked Tuna, anyone watch Wicked Tuna? Really? Okay, good. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so Wicked Tuna, it's, you know, it's based in Gloucester. It's a Nat Geo um, show, and it's about uh, competition for hunting bluefin tuna. This is the perfect storm uh, where it was in 1991. Three storm um, uh, situations converged, created a, a big problem, and this is the Andrea Gale that went down. So that's just a little bit about Gloucester. A little bit about myself is I was the mayor for seven years. That's four terms, two-year terms. And I left my in the middle of my fourth term to join the Baker administration, which has been very exciting and a lot of fun. And I became, I wasn't born and raised in Gloucester. Gloucester was at a crossroads. And I have a management consulting background. And I was traveling a lot um, and leaving my baby's home with my husband and a nanny. And I thought, okay, <laughs> something is wrong with this picture. So I kind of throttled down a little bit of my career. I ran for school committee, won my races for school committee. The mayor sits on school committee in a, in a city. The mayor has all the power. So on the school committee, I was like, okay, I think I need to be the mayor. And <laughs> so... I ran for mayor and won, and won all my subsequent races. And so my perspective on Gloucester is a little bit different. We have a core industry in the commercial fishery, and there's a lot of um, uh, devotion and historic um, affection for the commercial fishing industry, but it's under fire from the regulators and the regulatory agency overseeing commercial fishery is NOAA, the National Oceanic Atmospheric um, Administration. And underneath NOAA is the New England, um, the Fisheries Management Service, basically. And the argument that always took place is, are we overfishing? So the, re the quotas have been cut by NOAA. The catch is re severely restricted. Fishermen are going out of business. Um, the the uh, U.S. Department of Commerce declared an economic disaster area a couple of years ago because of the severe catch restrictions. And the environmentalists will say, you're overfishing, you're raping the oceans, you're, you're just sweeping all of the fish out of the oceans. And the fishermen will say, the fish are going somewhere else because they're following their feed, because of the temperature of the ocean. Now, fishermen are very good at finding the fish. That's what they do. And so there's this imbalance between what the observers in the environment, meaning the fishermen, see, and what the um, what NOAA, the federal regulators, are doing to try to assess the health of the stocks. So you have the regulators, you have the fishermen, and then you have the environmentalists all in the mix. And, and that makes for its own perfect storm. So the, um, this is a picture of the NOAA ship. It's a trawler. It goes out 62,000 square miles of ocean, the North Atlantic and they drop their net in probably less than a hundred locations and they scoop up the fish and they count them and they do some math and they decide how healthy the, the, um, the fish stocks are. It's a very sort of archaic way of counting fish. Um, so 
part of the battle that we have is to bring in data around climate change and ocean temperatures and the migration of the fish. And so trying to introduce new technologies, whether it's DNA assessment of um, fish tracings or cameras or other kinds of technology to have better ways of counting fish. Um, but NOAA is pretty steadfast. So um, that's the old school kind of method. And, and But they have a huge database and they can compare and they can say, well, it's normalized data and we can check it year over year and it's good enough. But if the fishermen will go out and say, I can walk on cod. There, there are more fish than ever, but they're not allowed to catch it. So that is a very short summary of some of the conflicts that we have. Um, this is, you know, a, some, is this green piece in the hold of a fishing boat with lots of fish and saying, you know, we're fishing out the oceans. Um, and again, the fishermen will tell you that they want to fish. They don't want government handouts. They don't want to be bailed out. They want to fish and they want to f fish in a, a sustainable manner. Um, and are, are very much on the front lines of seeing the impacts of climate change as they look at what the species are doing. So for us in Gloucester, you know, we battled NOAA. I've been to Washington a bazillion times. We've, we've, we've done a lot to try to make some progress. And um, it became clear that that's sort of a pretty um, multi-year multi-advocacy kind of um, effort. And meanwhile, back in the city, we knew under my leadership that we had to start looking at diversifying the economy, that we could not be a single, uh, single type, econ single industry economy any longer. And so we looked at, we undertook an economic development study for the city and said, all right, well, what do we want to We've been a fishing community for 400 years. What do we want to do next? And tourism is obvious, but we said we're going to do it in a way that leverages our strengths. So we have a schooner festival every Labor Day, it, which harkens back to the era of schooners filling Gloucester Harbor. That's a picture of during in the schooner festival. We have um, a, a harbor walk. I'm just going to kind of walk you through the the harbor. This is the inner harbor area along in here. This is Harbor Cove. This is our, our main street. And so what we did was we just wanted to tie the this part of the harbor to our main street so that people could circulate and have access and, and see the working waterfront. We never wanted to replace or pave or jeopardize the working waterfront in any way. We just wanted to show it and be able to access it. This is a little um, peninsula, and this is an area that I'll show you in a minute that's going to have, is, is a, there's a uh, hotel under construction right there that was fairly controversial. And then here is that greater outer harbor, and then the ocean is like, so there's the outer harbor and then the inner harbor. So all very, very protected, not subjected to the impacts um, of, you know, big storm surges. So that was one, one way that we looked at the economy. And then we also um, said the fishing industry has to be a part of our economic development plan, but in a different way. So we have um, going from thinking about the economy as a – low volume, high price fish producer, as opposed to that high volume, low price fish. So Cape and Fresh Catch is little, it's a subscription. You can subscribe to the program and they will deliver to you any kind of fish that's coming off the boats that particular day. So it's leveraging underutilized species. It's getting people to understand the fish that they are getting is caught sustainably because every fish in Gloucester, because it's so heavily regulated, is caught sustainably. Um, and then the infrastructure are to support the industry. So that working waterfront, you have to have ice on the waterfront for a boat to pull up 
dump the ice into the hold to keep the fish fresh. So, so we're trying to preserve that working waterfront for the fishing industry, balance it with tourism. And then the other opportunity that we see is this whole world of marine science and technology. We said we're a, co we're a port, we have port assets. This is the research vessel for Ocean Alliance. They have recently moved to Gloucester, their headquarters, and this is their research boat. That boat has been all around the world and they have the largest database of ocean pollution in the world. And they collect that data on that boat with laboratories. It's kind of a modern day Jacques Cousteau, if you will. They also invented the snot bot. I don't know if you've ever heard of that, but they're, they've, they're originally known for their whale research. So the founding scientist, Dr. Roger Payne, was the one who discovered that whales sing. And so they have spent the last 40 years or so um, on whale research and have expanded to ocean pollution, et cetera. So the snot bot, they deploy it, flies over a whale that is spewing, collects the snot, the DNA, and takes it back. And they can measure, you know, viruses, um, pollutants, you name it. You know, the, that DNA extraction is um, much easier with snot bot than it is trying to chase a whale and pierce it and extract some tissue for their experiments. So that's an example that's happening out of Gloucester now. So that to us is really the economy that we're trying to build, understanding that climate change and the tools that you need to, to look at that, the instrumentation and the deployment offshore to collect data needs port, uh, port assets to be able to do it. This is a robotic tuna. This is made in Waltham in Boston Engineering, but it's another example of um, a, a marine tech technology that's being used today. And that will do exploration, homeland security. It will go underwater to look at infrastructure that is underwater rather than sending divers down. It can take pictures, collect great data. So some really, really cool stuff happening in the world of marine science and technology. So that's kind of the economic transition that the city is attempting to, um, to, to um, have occur. In my role with the Baker administration, I serve with the Lieutenant Governor on the Seaport Economic Council. And our job in that, with that hat, because I do a lot of other things as well, is just to make some strategic investments and start to grow what we consider to be the maritime economy. There's 78 coastal communities in Massachusetts, 30 coastal, community, coastal states in the nation. And if you look at all the different in clusters across the maritime economy, Massachusetts is in the top 10 or top five and even number one in some of those different segments. So we, we see the marine science and tech, maritime economy, um, opportunity in our economy as, as an area of, of high growth. Um, so with that kind of expansion, diversification, and investment in the city comes development. And everybody wants to be on the water. So this, you can't really see it, but FEMA, which is the Federal Emergency Management Association, put out their maps, so their FEMA flood maps. And basically, it's looking out over the 100-year events, which are really happening every 25 years, some people will say, and determining what the flood lines will be. And it can dictate where you can build, where you can't, or sometimes, most importantly, what your insurance rates are for flood insurance. So people, when the maps came out, um, there was a huge revolt by homeowners and businesses saying my insurance went from 2000 to $20,000 a year on these FEMA flood maps. And people came to me as the mayor to try to overturn or challenge or sue FEMA 
based on these flood maps. And what was interesting is that the town of Rockport, which is next door to us, the town undertook a challenge to the theme of flood maps funded by the town. And I refused. I, I just said, you know what, whether they're right or wrong, or it's 10 feet or 12 feet or eight feet, we, we know these impacts are coming. We know we need to have some sustainable development principles around coastal development. We're not going to take on FEMA in our 62 miles of coastline. So if you want to challenge it and you're a property owner, feel free. Get together with all your neighbors, hire your scientists and your lawyers, and challenge those maps. But as a municipality, we are not going to do that. So, um, and that was met with some consternation. Um, this is... <laughs> <laughs> I know. I definitely got bolder towards the end, you know. <laughs> you know, anyone who follows this, and, and I think Sandy had just happened. And so when, when you are sitting there and Sandy's roaring up the coast and you're the mayor and Halloween is like four days away and you're trying to say, all right, am I canceling Halloween? And I was one of the ones that rescheduled Halloween. And I, I mean, and we, and I had people who were very upset about that, but we're in these emergency management planning meetings, debating all of the threats that are barreling down to us. And you get, you, you have that experience, right? You try to make some decisions and, you know, the FEMA flood maps come out and you're like, makes sense to me. <laughs> So this is um, a hotel that's being built currently. It's on that little patch that I showed you where I said the hotel was being built. It's, it's not on the ocean side, okay? It's on the harbor side. And it's 100 rooms, and it is right on the water. It took seven years to get that hotel um, to the point where it's at today. It was, it was one of the things that I believed in for the city business class, year-round hotel. We want marine science and tech. We were able to bring Endicott College as a satellite campus. There's some big industrial companies in our industrial parks. They have no place to stay because all our hotels are motels, don't take credit cards sometimes, and don't have a bar. And so business travelers want to go to a year-round business class hotel. And I felt as part of a business infrastructure for the community that this was necessary. And so it's, did they have to build a seawall and did we get sued over yet that? Yes, absolutely. It's part of what took it so long. But again, if you look at these things and weigh them and say, all right, where is that situated? What are the mitigation um, development principles that they've used? And they built to the standard that was set forth in the FEMA flood map. And, you know, so they embraced that, cost them more money. But, um, you know, so there's a way to do the waterfront development that takes into account the impacts of climate change. And on the converse side, this is our back shore. So this is um, that outer eastern point area. It's about a mile and a half. It's spectacular. These two houses are right here. This house got wiped out in the perfect storm. It was rebuilt, and you can tell with this storm, they're all boarded up. And so that house probably will be lost again at some point. This parcel right here, last night, a property, the, the owner of that property went before the Conservation Commission and said, I want to build a house here on stilts. Now, you know, Facebook and <laughs> the message boards are burning up about this because, um, first of all, there's no structures on the ocean side of this stretch. Okay, so that's number one. And then number two is it's a tiny, tiny little, there's like the, 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 the patch of grass is less than half of this U, U shape. And that's where they want to build a house. So this will be very, very controversial in the community, and I'm really glad I'm not the mayor for that one. 
Um, but that just gives you an idea of sort of the scope, the good, the bad around some of the waterfront development piece. And, and for a guy who owns this property, money is not an object. So he doesn't care if it costs him $50,000 on the flood insurance. Okay. So, so you just take that out of the equation, um, in terms of decision making. So we, so that's the development kind of side of the equation. And then of course we have threats. So the storms that occur. And this is just a, I forget. Oh, this is Irene again. Um, so kind of the, the way that this goes is preparedness. So you have to be prepared for these storms. Then when the storm hits, you have your re storm response. Then there's the recovery and cleanup, and then any kind of mitigation, which is typically your disaster relief funds that are coming in. So when I was mayor, we had a number of storms. We had Nemo, we had Sandy, we had, I think we had, I'm pretty sure we, when was Irene? We had Irene, we had um, nor'easters can be as, as damaging and they're, they're not named storms. And we instituted um, an emergency management protocol that was really a culture shock for the city. So when we're preparing for the storms, 48 hours ahead of a storm, I bring in Department of Public Works. You got your chainsaws ready? The fire department, how you got, you know, is everything fueled up? How the whole, you know, every, you go through all the equipment checks. The police department, the harbor master, the coast guard, the Department of Public Health that's looking at shelter and the school department, because those are some of our biggest buildings. And, you know, children in schools during storms is, is a call you always have to be really careful of in terms of timing. And so it, it, the first storm, the police did their thing. DPW did their thing. There was no coordination. It's like no one talked to each other. So when you have the, like a windstorm came blowing through and there were 120 trees that came down. But we couldn't tell if it was 120 times one or 60 times two because the citizen would call the fire department, tree down. They would call the police department, tree down. They'd call 911 because there's different phone numbers, tree down. Or they'd call the DPW directly, tree down. Now is that four trees, is that one tree? So there was no centralized way of um, assessing what the damage was that we were seeing during the storms itself. So we set up a culture around an emer emergency operations center that was had to be staffed 24 hours a day. Now people, my team did not like it because the cop wants to be with his cops at the police station. They don't want to be in the room with the fire department, the DPW, but we, we got through a lot of those cultural issues as we um, rolled out how the emergency operations center would actually work. And we took people through tabletop exercises. So a tabletop exercise is a mock disaster. You bring all those resources into a room and you spend the day trying to figure out how you're going to deal with the cruise ship that just had an outbreak of Ebola. And you have to evacuate 600 people from that cruise ship to your shore to a hospital somewhere. And you throw everyone in the room, give them the scenarios. And that's the safest, best place to do these exercises is on a tabletop. And we did a variety of scenarios. I was always killed off because like I could never stay the whole day. So they'd send in the ticket saying new, you know, new scenario, mayor, you know, got Ebola or, or something um, to take me out of the picture. But they tried to be as realistic as possible. Um, so some of the ones that we did were around pandemic, power outages, um, a lot of people who, who just, you know, you have to have neighbors checking on neighbors. You have to have an infrastructure to do that. Ice storms, evacuations, cruise ship. Now this particular, um, and this, then there are the things that you can't really, you can't really plan for. So one day I was in my office, 
spectacular, hot, humid August day, uh, just before Labor Day. And, but there was a hurricane offshore, and I can't remember which one it was. And so the storm surge and the waves and the riptides were hitting our shores. So I was in my office, first call was Coast Guard. Someone just got swept off the rocks, um, response in progress, fatality, okay? Five minutes later, second call, another part of the shoreline, um, another person swept off the rocks, was recovered, put in an ambulance. <laughs> the paramedic says to me, you know, we're working them. And I'm like, okay, <laughs> tell me, tell me, you know, if he lives, right? He's, they're right in the middle. He's working them in the ambulance, calling the mayor to let me know. So that's our, that's the second call. Third call, lifeguards on the beach. We're pulling people out of the water, broken arms, broken ankles, because the riptide, can, and then the waves just slamming them down to the, and so now the paramedics, I mean, the lifeguards are overwhelmed. So I call my emergency team together. We have to send, this is a paramedic on the beach in Gloucester, pulling people out of the water. I sent all the paramedics down to the beach, and I said, ankle swimming only, which means you can go only go to your ankle. Now, in Gloucester, you have two big, huge beaches. There's 7,000 people on these beaches. So it's a hot, sunny, beautiful August day. And the mayor says you can only go up to your ankles. Because I know we just lost one off the rocks. We're working one in the ambulance. And I know we're hauling people away with broken limbs. So I issue the order. Guess whose cell phone lit up? <laughs> 7,000 people who just paid $30 to park in our parking lot. So, you know, they're not popular. To, and, I, and I said to my guys, the, the chief, police, fire chief, DPW, no one dies on a Gloucester beach. That is, that is the operating assumption that we're, we're working under. Um, and so we issued a beach advisory. We notified the media. Every news truck from here to Providence came up. What is, what's happening in Gloucester? And no, you know, everybody was safe, but trying to educate people about the dangers of a riptide who come to the beach twice a year and they, they don't see the problem is very, very difficult. In that same, that same time period, um, people were lost up at Hampton Beach in New Hampshire. You, I, I forget the time frame, but anyway, you could find that out. Um, so those are the things that came, that just came out of the blue. There was no preparation, I think, that we could have done for that. Um, so then when, when you're in a storm situation and the, you, you've called in your people, you're manning your emergency operations center with all the functional areas, and you're a small city, you have problems of 20, how long is the duration of the storm? 48 hours, you know, in manning this thing for 24 hours a day. So we, there's a national model called Citizen Community Emergency Response Team, CERT. Anyone ever hear of CERT? So these are citizens who volunteer and they're trained on some of the basics of helping through an emergency situation. So they can identify and anticipate hazards. So they can actually go and in their neighborhood, if they, if they stay in place, and they can call in the tree situations. Small fires, if we can't get, um, and so they're trained, they have equipment. Um, not, not take over the emergency responders role. A lot of times what we used our CERT volunteers for was manning the emergency operations center and answering the phones. So we were able to give a single number to citizens, the hotline number, and the calls would all come in centralized so that we had really good data around um, what was occurring real time. And then you have all your functional areas there and you can talk about it. The, the other piece 
on that was the documentation. So once the storm is all said and done, if the president has declared a disaster area and you want to get reimbursed for the cost, you have to have impeccable records for getting money. So we always did really well in terms of getting money back from um, different storm events because of the way that we had our volunteers trained and deployed. So that was, um, um, you know, something that, that still goes on. So, you, so we're a coastal community. We deal with storms and we're progressive. Gloucester is really progressive. These, there are three huge wind turbines that are on the skyline of Gloucester. Has anyone seen the Gloucester wind turbines? I think, do you, what do you think? Yeah, they're very cool. So these two have my name on them, like really big letters, but you can only, <laughs> you can only see my name with binoculars because I didn't want them to be so big. <laughs> but if you go, if you look, you will, you will see Carolyn A. Kirk, mayor on these turbines. And so if you look at turbines in, um, different areas. So Falmouth, right? That just got shut down. That that turbine was, um, they're trying to figure out a way to keep it on, but it's a huge hue and cry around that turbine. And so we said, we want to do this. And what we did was we just educated the community. Um, I, and I was mentioning beforehand that when I was mayor, I wrote probably 300 columns in the, in, the, in the daily newspaper every Saturday, educating the community about why we were doing what we were doing. I, I wrote a bunch of columns about the wind turbines explaining the benefits. So the wind turbines, one is owned by a private company and two are in a power purchase agreement with the city that I signed, 25 year deal worth $11 million for the city six and a half kilowatt, um, so two and two plus 2.5, six and a half kilowatt. And I forget what the equivalent is in terms of cars off the road and barrels of oil. And But we had all those statistics and we put them out to the community and said, this is the offset. This is what we save on the carbon footprint. Um, the Varian one is the largest one on the whole East Coast. I mean, that thing is almost 500 feet tall from the top of the blade down. I don't, I think it is the, the largest one and the two for the city are not far behind. Um, so what, how did we get the community to buy in? Well, first of all, you have a captive audience because we are a coastal community and they, they're trying to reduce the reliance on fossil fuel, but this is a, a flicker chart. Have you ever seen some of the wind turbine, Criticism is the shadowing that happens, like it's repetitive shadows that give people headaches and this and that. This is part of the problem in Falmouth, is that they were sighted so that there's a shadowing effect on different people's homes. And also there can be some noise issues. So, but you can map this all out. So this is the winter shadow going into our watershed. And this is the summer shadow and the tips impact a couple of houses just during that period of time. So when we were building support in the community, we went door to door, the city council um, for the area went door to door and we said, um, this is, this is going to be the, the shadowing. It all has to go through a public process, public hearings. And what the city council did is they wrote into the special permit that those turbines had to be turned off every night in the summer for two hours during the period of the shadowing. And that's, that's what we did. And so when you go to Gloucester between five and seven on a summer night, the, the turbines aren't turning and that's why. But that was the kind of thing that we had, to, that was the level of detail that we had to do to get the community to support the change in the, um, the skyline. We also did the, the, this, the um, 
education around energy consumption, petroleum still by far, renewable energy, this is as of 2013, still small, and wind out of that 10% is 17%. So wind is a really small aspect of, of the overall energy picture in the United States. But in our, in our city, um, we had a signing ceremony. The blades were in the area to be um, hoisted, and we had a ceremony where people could come and put their name to the blade. 2,000 people came to the site over a period of like three days, and they put their names on the – I was the first one to sign it. <laughs> and then, you know, in Sway, you can put in your name, and it'll bring you every image that's – out there about you on the internet. And so that one came up. I was like, oh, that's perfect when I put my name in. Um, so it was really a celebration for the community um, to be on sort of a leading edge of this kind of um, change in the skyline and the commitment of the city to, to the effort. And so on that particular day, um, this is a great poem. I'm not going to read it to you. It's called Sea Fever, but you should all write it down. And it talks about, I must go down to the seas again, to the lonely sea in the sky. And all I ask is the tall ship and the star to steer her by. And the wheels kick and the wind song and the white sails shaking. And it's, a, it's just a wonderful song about the wind and the beauty of being um, a coastal community with, you know, back in the original day of 1606 when Samuel de Champlain came in literally with a sail and a star to steer him by. Um, and so for Gloucester, it sort of comes full circle. You know, we have got our start with the power of the wind, and then we, we feel the effects of the power of the wind and how we harness and seize the power of the wind for positive is something that was really, really special about that particular day um, for Gloucester. So that is um, sort of the, the landscape view. We have 15 minutes for questions. And I know I, I don't know if I went too fast or too slow, but um, we can take, I can do questions, right? Yeah, yeah. Yep. So why why did Gloucester want to reduce fossil consumption so strong? So the question is, why would Gloucester want to reduce um, fossil fuel consumption so strongly? And um, as a coastal community, that we're the next Sandy, we're the next South Carolina. In terms of the flooding and the coastal surge that's happening, we're, we're, we, we live with that fear for our community every time one of those storms comes up the coast. And if you, so, so there's that factor as we see extreme weather, rise in seas, climate change. Um, and if you make the connection between that and fossil fuel, petroleum reliance, then it, that's a natural um, a s conclusion to draw. Right. 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 So for it took nine years for the first turbine, the Varian turbine, to go up. It took five years, I want to say, for the city ones to go up. My poll is I got reelected four times. I got elected and reelected. So, you know, and I'm out front. This is what we're going to do, guys. Here we go. Making all of these arguments, right? And I had opponents. I had counter arguments. I had people arguing the other side. 
I never lost a ward. I never lost a precinct. So that was good enough for me as the elected official. Now, do we have really smart people in the community who can write papers and give lectures? We had a, a lyceum at, at our library where it was a panel talking about the wind turbines, overflowing, people standing room only, really engaged, smart people um, who added to the depth of the knowledge around the issue, okay? Um, but that was, that's the only poll I needed. That, that's not a cop out. That's, you know, a mayor, um, who confronts controversial issues head on. Sometimes they lose and sometimes they don't. <laughs> yeah. Right. Every politician in Massachusetts fights Delaware. Right. So my question is, is it a prerequisite to be a, a politician in Massachusetts and fight Delaware to debate the science on that particular issue? Yeah, so the question is, you know, the, do you, do, is it a requisite to be, and I prefer the term elected official as opposed to politician. <laughs> Um, is that a requisite for um, for being an elected official in Massachusetts to fight NOAA? Okay, so the easiest easy side to pick is the side of the fishermen. Every elected official picks the side of the fishermen. Easy. Fight the federal government. Good enemy to have. Can't go wrong. No votes for me there, right? It's all about... Um, so with so there is that dynamic for sure. And one of the challenges that, that Governor Baker gave me was to help him understand the complexities around the fishing industry. And and I said to him, I said, there's two ways to go about this. You can every time you show up with a fisherman, you will get a headline. And and it's it's a play that's made over and over again. I've seen it and it and it's I don't like that necessarily. Or you can really dig in, put some academic horsepower behind this, maybe through UMass, maybe a little bit of resources, and bring some depth and counter um, alternatives and options around stock assessment and in a rational way open a dialogue with NOAA. And that's the path that governor's choosing, you know, really. And also through Seaport Council, we hope to fund some of those those initiatives. But you're right; it's it's an easy target, and a um, and the media falls for it every time. Yeah. So the um, so the question is, what is the involvement of the fishing community with NOAA and the um, stock assessments? So, fishermen by nature are really independent. There there have been various attempts over the years to build coalitions, and so the draggers don't like the trawlers, and the hook and line guys don't like the you know the 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 other ones, and then New Bedford is always in a fight with Gloucester. So there's there's this total fractionalization out there within the industry. And there have been some attempts to bring the industry together. Northeast Seafood Coalition is probably the best one. And they consistently advocate with NOAA to um, have fishermen do have fishermen participate in the scientific research. And and the funding is really inconsistent um, and spotty. So the fishermen are at the table and they will rally every time someone comes to town. If Elizabeth Warren comes to town, you know, all the fishermen will come out. Um, but from a funding standpoint on fishermen involved in using their, their, their fishing boats as research vessels, it's very, very inconsistent and spotty.
NOAA will do a $200,000 grant here and maybe 500000 there, but it's um, not reliable right now. And there's no, the industry doesn't have the, um, the financial reach to be able to get that funded themselves. And then, of course, the environmentalists are like really well funded. And, you know, so the fishermen in some ways just doesn't have a chance in, in some of those harder to uh, navigate areas that cost money. Yeah? Right. So, so the question is, what's the percentage of fishermen? Basically, how do they feel about the, this um, alter, the underutilized species? So, redfish, monkfish, dogfish. Um, you know, if they can, it's all about what they can land and what the prices they get off the dock. So, if red, if they can make a lot of money on redfish, dogfish have teeth, and so they chew through their nets. So, <laughs> no, seriously, and so the fishermen are like, but part of, part of the thing is fishermen are great innovators. So I know that there's fishermen right now trying to figure out a way to make their nets um, dogfish proof in terms of the, the biting. So um, I think, in my opinion, what will happen is we'll see aquaculture more and more. In fact, um, just over a year ago, I was in Japan on a tour of aquaculture installations and they're not tilapia you know it's not the Thailand kind of horror stories of aquaculture that we're seeing in Japan it's all very um, ecosystem based and they're making $35 a pound on yellowfin and they eat it raw so the fish has to be super clean disease free um, and and it's very high end and they've been at it for, we saw, they've been at it for like 50 years and the technologies around this are so advanced in terms of the hatchery, the vaccinations, the feed that they use, the, the way that they could put like scallops underneath the net to eat the, to try to set falls. Because some of this is the fear that you have when you talk about aquaculture on off our coastline, so that's what I think we're going to see is is aquaculture make a uh, run in not only Massachusetts but up and down the coast. Yeah. Um, when you're elected officials, I realize you're considering this as a career path, possibly. Were there things you wish you had known about the planet, about other areas that you became, and how did you feel the background that you had as a career student? Right. So any of you thinking about becoming elected officials? Um, things to think about. So I knew very little about the fishing industry. So, and I call it the fishocracy. <laughs> so it's, it's, it's its whole thing. And so my advice is um, just listen and listen to all sides. I never, there was a, there was a protest at NOAA. I think my first year I was the mayor. And they were burning the director in effigy in the parking lot. And they're, and the, they're all coming by my office saying, you got to get up there. You're the mayor. And I said, I am not going anywhere near that. That is not effective advocacy. So listening to all sides. So I would listen to Noah. I would listen to the fishermen. Not so much the environmentalists, because that they were never sort of on the ground in the city. They're more of a factor. Um, in Washington through lobbyists. Um, and so listening to all sides, that never, never steered me wrong. And the subject matter expertise to run a city, you know, you become an expert not only in fish, but in, oh, let's talk about water and sewer. Um, <laughs> you know, when I was the mayor, we boiled our water for 21 days because we had a catastrophic failure of the infrastructure. You know, I got the call. I was down on the Cape for a friend's wedding. And um, they're like, I'm sitting on the beach with my husband. The call comes in. Uh oh, we had a little problem at the water treatment plant. Okay, keep me informed. Escalates, escalates. My husband says to me, You should go back. <laughs> I was like, I have people that can handle that. He's like, No, you need to go back. So 
off we went. 21 days, we boiled our water. And I became instantly an expert in chlorine, you know, um, bacteria that goes through your water system. It was a nightmare. Um, and I'm the face of it. And it's Labor Day weekend. And we have restaurants. We have Dunkin' Donuts can't serve coffee. <laughs> Gorton's can't make their fish sticks for McDonald's. Weddings can't have like the little gun for the bar for the vodka tonics um you know in, in dishwashing and and the nursing mothers that called me i'm poisoning their children um you know and the pets oh my god the pets <laughs> so, so so you know can you take a class in that absolutely not can you be really smart to know what you don't know and say, okay, who knows something here? And I, in, in that instance, we had a contractor that um, covered the, 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 the water system. And I didn't know anything about it, but I called a guy that I knew and I said, Tony, you got to tell me exactly what I have to say to this guy to get his attention because we're dying here. You know, literally, because they were not responding. He said, ask him this, 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 and this. Okay, great. So I get on the phone with the company, and I'm asking him all the questions, and he's still giving me the runaround. And it was a French company. And I said, "Listen, if I have to start, if I have to go so high in the food chain that I have to start speaking French, I will do that. I need someone here today, tomorrow." Um, and so that's the key: is really knowing what you don't know, listening to all sides, and then you are the ultimate decision maker, and just saying, "Do I have enough information to make a decision?" And some leaders never get to the decision-making part of it. They don't make decisions. I always did, you know. So who here wants to be an elected official? <laughs> oh, oh, good. Right. No, that's a really good point. And so you also deal with all the municipal unions. So when you're negotiating contracts with cops, firefighters, teachers, you know, that skill set right there is invaluable. Um, and there's ways to do that really well, and there's ways to not do that well. So that's a that's a really good good um, point. Yeah. So my, I'm my I'm director of energy environment here in the city of Medford. Oh, great. Oh, super. Because we're also working on resiliency and adaptation. Yeah. So I have both partially, I would say, as common from now since the school district, I have a question for you. Yeah. Right. Um, so the this in terms of sorry, I'm getting um, um, pinged. Um, the question. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. But I don't. Yeah, I go home. No one calls me anymore. Um, so the question is around sea level rise specifically. So in terms of those FEMA flood maps and looking at the master plan for the city and all of that, those zoning. Um, parameters and development principles, we look at it from that perspective. But what we really worry about on sea level rise is the surge. That's that's the problem. If the if the ocean's coming up two inches, you know, people, that's right. But that surge of two inches multiplied by a hundred thousand square miles of ocean barreling down on your shore. That's the problem, that, and that's the extreme weather piece. Um, so that's our perspective on it, which is why that house on stilts is just nuts. We've started to look at um, over the next 80 years, they're talking as much as five feet of sea level rise. Um, 
lines in this area, which would affect the Amelia Earhart Dam, which protects the next word. Yeah, okay. We're looking in the far future, not right. what's going to happen next year, but, like, you know, if you want to do something dramatic around a dam, you do kind of need to look 40 and 50 years right. in the future. Yeah, and I would, you know, I think that's part of the nomenclature now. Um, it's not, we didn't get that far. Um, there's, a, there's a level of awareness, but the operationalization of response and infrastructure investment is, like we have a sewer treatment plant that is below sea level, which is a problem that my administration put $25 million into because it was under consent order because it was leaching. Um, we couldn't even think about accommodating the future threat because we had a neglect. That was kind of the other story of my administration was the neglect around the infrastructure that had happened decades, and it fell on me to fix it all, which was the $100 million that you <laughs> referred to. Um, but, yeah, it has to be part of the dialogue, has to be part of our vernacular so that future leaders can carry that message forward. And I took it as far as I could, but that's as far as we got.